requires a little bit of work. So, I, I will tell you, to write a Christmas song, if you wrote an original Christmas song, it would, and it becomes popular, you're set for the rest of your life. Would you agree with that? Like, there's such a lack of good Christmas songs out there. So uh, there's the challenge. Write a good Christmas. If you write a good Christmas song, I'll buy you your first latte. That's on me. I, I, I'm so generous, aren't I? Turn to uh, Luke chapter 2. We're going uh, to use this as a jumping off point this morning. Um, as, as we're thinking about uh, the message, uh, I heard a story this week, really something unprecedented that happened in the automobile industry this week. And, and it's this. Tesla issued a recall for every one of their vehicles. So I think it was like Tuesday morning, I'm in my car, I'm listening to NPR because I love Jesus. And uh, uh, they said every Tesla is being recalled because there is a problem with the autopilot software. Now, I've been corrected because I don't understand how Tesla works, right? Uh, I'm a pastor, not, uh, not an engineer, okay? So I can't afford a Tesla. But um, I guess I, I said you have to take it back to the Tesla factory. They do all the recall there. I guess it's an over-the-air software update. So, but nonetheless, every Tesla needed to have this fix. Can you imagine? I've never heard of that with any automobile maker before, right? that at the heart of Tesla lies this software that controls the autopilot, and there's been so many accidents with Tesla that they've been under investigation for for years, and they've diagnosed the issue. The heart of the car is destructive, and it requires an update. And I'm thinking to myself this. That's the message of Christmas, because Christmas really is God's recall effort. That there's something at the heart of his creation that's, that's not right. There's something at the heart of his creation that ultimately is destructive and needs to be fixed. And praise God, we don't have to go to the factory, but the factory comes to us. The software update comes to us. Thank you, Jeremy, for that. Bonus points. He said, just so you know, it's a software update and it comes to you. I'm like, I'm using it. Yes, I'm an idiot when it comes to this stuff. Now I'm just less of an idiot when it comes to this stuff. But isn't it amazing? If you think about Christmas as this, God's recall work of saying to humanity, you're not right, you need a fix. And if you don't get fixed by the manufacturer, you're going to continue to lead a life of destruction. And I think we feel this. I think if we're honest with ourselves, uh, we feel this, and as, as hopeful as we are when Christmas rolls around, I think it doubles the, the impact on our hearts of how far we are from true freedom, true hope, true joy. I, I, we, we embrace this sanitized holiday, thinking that enough songs, enough cookies, enough hymns, enough movies... Colorized, black or white, whatever, debate among yourself about that one. But uh, enough of, of holiday cheer is going to somehow make up for this huge, huge vacuum that exists in our hearts. That Christmas is God saying to the world, you're not right. And you need help. And that help is only available through Jesus Christ. Which is, I think this is the, a literal come to Jesus moment for us. Um, This is where we have to stop and go, uh, we have to probably uncover the dark side of of Christmas, because some people would be like, there's a dark side of Christmas? There is a dark side, and unless you understand the dark side of Christmas, you'll never understand the the bright side of the holiday. That um, what God sends forth is his son to be condemned. That's the message today. Um, We're doing five weeks, December, to think about Christmas. We started with a a son promise. This goes all the way back to Genesis, that God has promised not to leave us in our sins, but to deliver us, to redeem us, just like in the song we sang, rescue us, right? This is God's rescue effort. He promises a son. He sends the son. David touched upon this last week, Galatians 4.4. At just the right time, God sends forth the son, born under the law, right, through through this woman, so that he would be the savior of, of, of his people, um, but then we have to ask ourselves the question today, why? Why are we being recalled? <laughs> why do we need this fix? Why can we not do this on our, on our own? And 
I think we're going to understand this. Because even as I, as, as I describe this, I think some of us feel the weight of trying to do things on our own and continuing to realize it's not going to work out. We enter Christmas hopeful and then come out on the other side deeper in hopelessness. I think we, we, we understand that enough lights and enough cookies and enough uh, eggnog and whatever you mix with your eggnog is going to somehow lift us up out of the, who likes eggnog here? I'm just curious. Okay, good. You're, you're my people. All right. So um, we have to realize that I don't, I, I'm praying that we don't miss another Christmas of really what's at the heart of, of the holiday. I'm praying that we don't leave here once again looking to people, family, hopefully no fights at the, at the table, um, everything just working out great, and putting in our expectations and things other than God because it's going to leave us in more despair than ever. Today's the message of hope. Today's a message of joy. Today's a message of freedom. So we look at, at, at Luke chapter 2 as a jumping off point because we see this in this Christmas account, right? We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are, these are um, eyewitnesses of the, the ministry of Christ. These are biographies of the ministry of Christ. The early chapters, especially with Matthew and Luke, uh, key us in on the shepherds and the wise men and the angels' appearances to Joseph and Mary. And all those things we're familiar with, right, when it comes to the, the Christmas narrative. Sometimes, though, there's these moments in the Christmas narrative that we don't look at that I think are important part, of, important part of the discussion. And one of them is what we find in Luke chapter 2. Look there at verse 25. Um, Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus are uh, at the temple because they're going to dedicate their baby. And this was Jewish custom. So they go to the temple, Joseph, Mary, baby Jesus. And in the temple, they have a couple interactions. There's one interaction with a guy named Simeon that I want to focus on. And Simeon says something it seems out of place in the Christmas narrative, right? But yet, it's the heart of the Christmas narrative. And I want us to look at this briefly before we get to Romans chapter 8. So we look at chapter 2 of Luke, starting at verse 25, and it says this. Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. Which is a really cool phrase. I love it because consolation is, is hopefulness. It's comfort. It's, it's this idea that God's got this. And so he was already aware of the promises made. He was already aware that the, the Father's going to send uh, a Messiah. So he's eagerly anticipating the arrival. Uh, it says here that he uh, was moved by the Holy Spirit in realizing that the Messiah was in his presence. Look at verse 26. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. How's that for a promise? Simeon, you're getting old. You're hanging out in the temple. You're holy. You're devout. I just want you to know you're not going to die until you see the Lord's Christ, the Lord's Messiah. What a cool thing, right? Verse 27, and he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, he took the baby in his arms and blessed God and said, now, Lord, somehow he knew this was the Messiah. What a strange way to enter the world, right? This, this, this God-man, this man-God. He's holding him in his arms, moved by the Spirit, knowing that this is the Messiah he's holding. He says, now your servant can depart in peace, right, according to your word, which my eyes have seen your salvation. He's looking. Salvation is not a process. Salvation is a person, Right? And he says, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the, and the, all the, and the glory of your people Israel. So he is just testifying. There's no one happier in the temple that day. He's excited. He's holding salvation. And then it takes a turn. And this is where I think the beauty of the scene really manifests itself. Look what he says. And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about Jesus. Just when you think Mary and Joseph knew, there's a lot they didn't know. Sure, the angel appears to them separately to encourage them, to, to caution them from, from doing things or not doing things that, that would, would harm their relationship, but the angels appear preparing them. But there's a lot they did not know. 
And so they're amazed. Simeon's testifying over their baby, ultimately their Savior, the Messiah. And then look what happens. Simeon blessed them and says to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. You know what he basically says to Mary? Your son is going to be the source of conflict. It's a weird thing to say to a new parent, right? So if I came to the Cornels and said, look at that little baby. Do you know she's going to be the source of conflict for people? You'd be like, whoa, who are you? Look at her. She's looking at me like, give me a little smile over there. Hi, precious. Right? But you guys would be like, dude, Pastor Scott is off today. Like, how dare he say that? But it's true. The son has come to interrupt us in a good way. Right? There's going to be conflict in my house today because the Bills are playing the Cowboys. We have both fans in our home, so pray for the Morgan house. But it's not a conflict like this. This is a deeper conflict. And as if there's conflict externally, Simeon presses in deeper. And look what he says to Mary. And I, and I would imagine the gaze, unbroken, unblinking. Look at verse 35. And a sword will pierce even your own soul. You know what this says, is it says, Mary, you have been given a gift. But just so you know, you're going to be walking a path of watching your son suffer. There's going to be pain, there's going to be sorrow, there's going to be grief. You're going to be confused. You know, Mary, did you know? There, there's a lot she didn't know. You want to know why? Because it says in the Gospels, there came moments when she and the other kids in the household thought Jesus was out of his mind. He said, what, what are you talking about? What are you going to do? And he's like, almost like, get behind me because you're not my mother, or father, my brothers, my sisters. Those who are my brother, father, brothers, sisters are the ones who do my will. There's times when he corrects his mom, doesn't say mom, he says woman. There's the things she didn't understand. And especially as this, this three-decade journey to the cross which she would have never anticipated, like, this is going to be how this is played out. She's standing there weeping before the cross, watching her son be crucified. And the son looks down at, at mom and then John and says, there's your mother, mom, there's your son. Like, what a cool moment where God in flesh says, take care of each other. But she's still mourning, she's, she's still weeping. Because she would have never played out this scenario in her mind. You better believe her, her soul was pierced like a sword, with a sword. On, on one hand, a parent should never bury their child. I, I've experienced this with my own mom dying and watching my grandparents grieving, never coming to peace with God, dying a bitter death, going to their grave with hostility and anger towards God that they would have to bury their own daughter. She, she's feeling this. It's a real pain. It's a real grief. It's a real sorrow. But it's not a hope that, doesn't, that disappoints. It's a hope that doesn't disappoint because we know that the cross is not the end of the, 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 the journey. There's a, there's a grave and then there's a resurrection, right? And, the, and, and mom could celebrate, wow, like even though I could never have scripted this out, she's going, my son's alive. And more importantly, the Savior, the one she even in her song says, my Savior will deliver me. He's alive, See, that's where the hope is. The hope is sometimes realizing that life doesn't work out the way we think it's going to work out. And sometimes life can cause severe pain and anguish in our souls. But, but if you have Jesus, it's all going to make sense eventually. There's a hope that will not disappoint. And there's a freedom even in the journey with the difficulties that, that's afforded us because of Christ. And so we may feel the pain of that sword piercing our own souls today. But my goal my prayer is that you would leave here rejoicing in the freedom that's given to you by the Son, Jesus Christ himself. And we have to uncover some, some dark things. Why did Jesus have to journey this way? We, we forget that the three-decade-long journey leading to a cross was really so that he could provide a pathway to the presence of God because that's where our hearts belong, right? The Maker's recalling us or in another word, restoring us to himself because 
he would rather die for you than live without you. Which brings us to Romans chapter 8. Turn there, and this is where we're going to camp out. I will tell you, Romans chapter 8 may be the greatest chapter in the Word of God. Uh, I've always challenged people and said, hey, would you want to memorize this with me? What, what, what would it be like a people who just memorized Romans chapter 8? Because there's so much here. Um, You've heard me quote it time and time again. Matter of fact, a couple verses I'll read. You'll be like, oh, Pastor Scott says that all the time because there's such rich truth here. And the experience of, of what we're going to talk about this morning makes that truth just explode into joy and hope and enthusiasm and excitement. So I may smile, I may cry, I may sweat, I may yell, I may scream. Why? Because you can't come to Jesus and understand what he's done for you and not feel this way, right? We have to realize what God has done in pioneering this way to the presence of God and that it deserves our mind, heart, soul, and strength and everything we've got. Um, there's a good God who loves us. And if we, if we miss the message of the son condemned, we're going to miss the message of Christmas. And I would venture to say verse 3 of chapter 8 of Romans is the best Christmas verse in the world, how about that? That's, that's kind of provocative, isn't it, and incendiary. Romans 8, verse 3 is the best Christmas verse in all the world. But let's look at verse 1, shall we? Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is there no, uh, therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Some of you are like, Pastor Scott says that all the time. That's like ad nauseum, right? Like that is just one of those go-tos that I need to remind my own heart, this is, this is my identity. I no longer stand condemned before God because of Jesus. Woo! That, gives, that makes me want to do a little pep in my step like that. Some of you are like, what, what's happening? Is he convulsing up there? He didn't have his oatmeal today, right? Like, it, you just can't help but walk a little bit straighter, have a little pep in your step, right? Be excited. There's now, now, right now, today, no condemnation for anyone who's in Christ Jesus. Scott Morgan, chief of sinners, whoa, crazy. Verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set us free from the law of sin and death. So there's freedom. There's liberty. There's now no condemnation, but there's freedom and there's joy. Then verse 3. How? Why? Please explain this to me. Here it is. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Circle those two words. Here's the gospel in four words. You can't, God did. Isn't that cool? Like, simplify it, right? Some of us are like, define the gospel. Oh, I, I, you got to come up with some, like, paragraph, two paragraphs. I'm going to give it to you in four words. You can't, God did. And all God's people said, you better believe it. God did. What did he do? Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemns sin in Jesus' flesh. Here it is, the message of Christmas. Why did the son have to come? Because being 100% divinity, 100% humanity, completely God, completely human, could identify with us as, our, as humanity, but also perfect spotless, blameless, sinless. He becomes that high priest who can sympathize with us in our weaknesses and our struggles, but yet without sin. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. See the word condemnation there? Notice how in verse 1 he mentions condemnation. In verse 3 he mentions condemnation. He's going to mention it again in this chapter. Why? Because the biggest thing that stands against all of humanity is this. We, are, we, we stand condemned, and we feel it. We feel the condemnation. Condemnation brings guilt. Condemnation brings shame. Condemnation brings a sense of inadequacy. Sin brings, uh, uh, condemnation brings this sense of we fall short. We feel the weightiness of, of trying to dig ourselves up out of this pit. But with yet more effort, we, we seem to get deeper rather than higher. Right? This is what condemnation does. And it stands over every single one of us. So here what I would, I would venture to say is this. Condemnation is the barrier to real freedom. We stand condemned. And it's because of the law 
which Paul references in verse 3, that it cannot give liberty and it cannot give life. See, we need to understand something is that God has made himself known in creation. He's made himself known in our consciences. He's made himself known through the law. But none of those things can save. They can only reveal how far you fall short, but they can never redeem. Right? If I look in a mirror, hopefully someone looked in a mirror. Anyone else look in a mirror today? Some of you need to go back and look in the mirror. I'm just looking at you right now going, yeah, you... That mirror, I don't know what, is it one of those funhouse mirrors, mirrors that make it look all like weird and concave and whatever, but you know, you look at a mirror, right, and what does the mirror do? It reveals truthfully what you look like, but the mirror can't change you. It can only reveal what's, what's there. Amen? So the, the mirror reveals, but it can't, it can't change you. Um, if I have, so I brought a little prop this morning, my neighbors were thinking I was crazy as I was digging out wood from my backyard this morning, so... I have an eight-foot plank right here, uh, and if I ask Tom, my father-in-law, give Tom a hand. Stand up, Tom. Tom. So Tom, come stand next to this plank. So this is an eight-foot plank, right? If I told you the eight-foot plank is the standard, and Tom needs to be eight feet, I can yell at this plank all I want. Make Tom eight feet. But what's it powerless? You can not even. You can get on my shoulders. You're probably not going to get there, right? You can stand on your tippy toes. You can have you know Dick help you up. Or Tom falls short of the eight foot standard, doesn't he? And no matter how much he tries to be eight feet, he's not going to do it. As much as if this wood could talk to Tom and say, "Be eight feet, be eight feet," he'll, he's never going to be eight feet, is he? He will. This will show you what eight feet looks like, but will always fall short of the mark of what is required. It's the same thing with the law. Thank you, Tom. Give him a hand. Here's your parting prize. You could, you could take that home. No, just kidding. So, so the law was given to show us how far we fall short of what God requires. And I'm going to tell you right now, none of us can, can meet that level of perfection. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no one that can measure up. As a matter of fact... This is, the, this is the heart of every single person who tries to measure up and realizes that they can't. Now, if we're truly honest, religion is the worst thing in the world for people because it promises that if you only do this, this, and this, you'll, you'll somehow attain to some level of enlightenment, nirvana, paradise, whatever you want to call it. But in reality, there is no certainty and no assurance that you'll ever measure up because it's all based upon what you do. You can never talk to a Mormon, a Catholic, a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Hindu, someone who follows Socrates, someone who follows Confucius. You name it. Every world religion teaches you can do something, but it doesn't have the assurance to back it because you'll never know if you've done enough, which doubles down then on your guilt and shame. Christianity comes along and says, you can't, God did. You can't, God did. And this now makes the law, which was never designed to redeem you, that, that pointer to how far we fall short. So the law cannot give liberty, cannot give life, but what it does do is it brings you to your knees so that you're forced to admit your helplessness. Right? It is that tutor, Paul says in Galatians, if you want to read a great chapter on this, Galatians chapter 3. It brings us to our knees to show us how far far we fall short. And for some of you that like a challenge, I'm always up to a challenge, I'm going to try to live my life perfectly. Good luck with that, right? I'm going to tell you right now, just today, you guys have already committed so many sins. And some of you are like, no, I haven't. Well, just the admission that you haven't is prideful. Therefore, that's a sin you're guilty. <laughs> Welcome to the club of sinners, right? I am 53 years old. I have spent a lifetime accumulating sins in my life. Enough sins to plunge me headlong into an eternal, Christless eternity deserving of God's damnation and condemnation of me. And yet, what hope do I have? Because I do not present myself as one who 
is ready to suffer eternity apart from God. What hope do I have? Christ. I have come to understand the beauty of Romans 8, verse 3, that God made him the condemnation on my behalf. What hope is there for me? Galatians 3, 13. Look what Paul says here in, in this wonderful passage. It says, Galatians 3, 13, Paul writes, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, right? The law is a beautiful thing, is a magnificent thing, is, is a, a wonderful thing, but it's also a curse because it can never redeem you. But there's one who stood in, Christ, the law, by becoming a curse for us, for his written curses everyone who hangs on a tree. Christ became a curse for Scott Morgan so that I could be free from the law of sin and death. That's why I get to smile today. Yay! Trust me. I didn't come to know Christ as a child. God saved me as a teenager. And up until those teen years, and even in those teen years when I was redeemed by Christ, there was this, still this, this voice that said, self-effort, self-efficiency, self-righteousness. And God continues to speak against those very phrases because I can't, but God does. The beauty is knowing this. What God is able to do in you is far greater than anything you could do in yourself. The law, ladies and gentlemen, is powerless. God is powerful. James 2.10. This is it, right? For whoever keeps the whole law. So James is saying, you want to try to keep the whole law? Good luck. <laughs> he says, but fail in one point, you become guilty of all of it. So if there's ever been one moment in your entire life where you've messed up, you deserve condemnation. Well, here's the good news. There existed on the cross with Christ this thing called the great exchange. Our sinfulness for his righteousness. This has to do with Christ. Point number two. Here's the message of Christmas. Here's the gospel of Christmas. Here's the heart of Christmas. The basis of real freedom. People want to be free. They just don't know how to be free. They double down on trying to be self-righteous, self-sufficient, self-efficient, all this stuff. And it can only lead to almost like a double damnation, right? Like, I'm doing good things. How many of you have talked to a neighbor? And you know, if you did a man-on-the-street interview, woman-on-the-street interview, hey, where are you going to go when you die? People would be like, I'm going to heaven. Well, why? Because I'm a good person. Right? I've done good things. I've given the good organizations, and I love my neighbor, and I'm compassionate with my coworkers, and, and they go through this litany of stuff. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to tell you, though, deep down inside, we throw those things out, but we feel the weightiness of how far we fall short. If God has set eternity in our hearts, and we fall short of the glory of God, we feel the weight of trying to do this ourselves, and we can't. That's why there's anger in this world. The root of anger is not there's a lack of peace in the Middle East. That's not the root of anger. The root of anger is your guy's not in the White House. That's not the root of anger. The root of anger is this. There's this thing called sin that holds our souls in bondage. And the enemy uses that against us to remind us of how far we fall short. Well, Christ has come to give you freedom. Christ has come to give you joy. Christ has come to give you hope. Look what it says, verse 3, for what the law could not do, right? It can only reveal, it can't redeem. Christ, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Look at verse 4. In order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, he fulfills what the law demands, and he does it for us. That's what that says. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but now we walk according to the Spirit. So here's what I want you to consider as we think about the basis of real freedom, Christ. It, and it's, it's this. As God, he couldn't represent us. As a man, he could. 
and he is both in one person. 100% deity, 100% humanity. And ultimately, Good Friday is the purpose of Christmas. You can't have one without the other. So if you, hear, if you see me on the street and I go, Merry Christmas, and I say, He is risen, don't get confused. Because they work together. You can't have Christmas without Good Friday and Easter, and you can't have Good Friday and Easter without Christmas. Right? There's this journey between the incarnation and ultimate condemnation on the cross that we have to talk about. Because God could have easily sent the Son on Good Friday, say, hey, you made it. Okay, hit the cross, get buried, get risen. We make this thing a three-day deal. And yet we make it a 30-decade deal. Why? Because there's two things you need to understand. There's the passive obedience of Christ, and there's the active obedience of Christ. And I'm hoping that we get to, if you understand this, because this is Romans 8, 3, you are going to be the most hopeful, joyful, celebratory, excited, enthusiastic, optimistic person in the entire world. Because John 3, 16, very familiar verse, right? For God so loved the world that he gave. And we can rattle off, but we forget about 17 and 18. Look at John 3, real quick. For God so the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, right? We're all good. Then verse 17. For God did not send the son into the world to what? To condemn the world. There's the word condemn. The son hasn't come to condemn. Just so you know, you have not come to condemn. Some Christians think, my role is to condemn people. No, it's not. Stop condemning people, right? Stop being, you think, uh, like, I'm playing the role of the Holy Spirit today. No, let the Spirit be the Spirit. You just be you. The Son did not come into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So here's what John says, very beginning of the gospel. The issue is condemnation. Who will take your condemnation? Will you believe in Jesus? Or will you try to muster this thing by yourself? There's hope, and then there's stupidity. <laughs> right? The son hasn't come to condemn. He has come to be condemned. For all who would believe. You know what? Believe contains two words. Turn and trust. Believing is turning from sin and trusting in God. So another way of saying repentance. You turn and you trust. And what I love about John 3, 16 is this. Not only do we celebrate Emmanuel, God with us, we celebrate God for us. Here's why, here's why we can declare from the rooftops the greatest message the world needs to hear is that God is not against you. He's for you. Right? And I don't want Jesus. I don't want God with you. I want God in you. This is what the, the life of a Christian is. It's not me with Jesus. It's me in Christ. There's union. Write that word down, union. This is Paul's favorite phrase to use for believers. You are in Christ. You are in him and he is in you. And whoever's in him, you can abide in him. You can live with him. You can draw from his strength. You can draw from his power. And you can be the people that God has wired you to be. And it doesn't rely upon you. It's entirely of him. The cooperative part says, I'm going to obey. I'm going to do what God wants me to do, and he's going to give me the power to live the life that he wants me to live. You don't want to be with Jesus. You want to be in Christ. And herein lies the difference, right? The most serious danger of all is the danger of con the condemnation of God. And if God is for us, then sin and death and the devil will fail to destroy us. But if God is against us, nothing can save us. And we feel this. So his, Jesus' supreme purpose in coming to this world is to be an offering for sin. Because let me just tell you this. Without the sacrifice of Jesus for the sins of the world, everything else Jesus did would have left us in our sins still separated from God, from God and hopeless. He's not just some example. He becomes our condemnation. Now, sometimes I, I'll talk to people and, and they'll ask this question. I'm sure some of us have asked this too. It seems like a strange way to save the world. Agreed. 
why couldn't God just forgive sin, and why did Jesus have to be involved? You ever thought, anyone ever thought that? Like, why couldn't God just say, like, we live in a world that says, God's love. Come on, man, God's love. Couldn't he just say, I forgive you, and then just kind of sweep everything under the carpet? God is not a God of love first. God is a God of holiness first. Every attribute of God derives from his holiness. But what you have with the holiness of God are two attributes that are both important. I'm going to ask you to write these words down. God is just and God is merciful. And this is what's beautiful about Jesus being both God and human. Is that he is able to take the justice of God, but also show the mercy of God. See, we want a God who is both just and merciful. If God was only just and not merciful, he would demand payment for your sin, what you could never pay for. But if he was just merciful, then he would not be a just God, and then everything would be against his character. Because don't you have this feeling that there's this, we, we, we live in this world where there's justice, and we demand justice, don't we? We hear news stories, we read of things, and we have court systems and judges set up so that not only are things brought to light, but things have penalties attached to them because there's certain wrong that's done. And forgiveness means that a debt has occurred and someone's going to have to pay that debt. See, with God being just, we have to understand that he is a God who is perfectly righteous, and because he is perfectly righteous, he has to punish sin. Sin has incurred a debt before him, and he just can't pass over it. A price has to be paid. But yet, he's merciful. So think about this. God has found a way to both show mercy and not deny his justice by having his son pay a price for our sin in our place. So say I go to court. And I I would, before God, be able to tell you in all honesty, I've never been to court. Yay! Knock on wood. Uh, I'm not expecting anything to change with that, but say I go to court and I'm I'm on trial for something. And the judge says, "Um, what do you have to say for yourself? And I say, I'm sorry. Well, I appreciate you apologizing. I appreciate you asking for forgiveness. But just so you know that there's a penalty that's part of your, of, your, of, your, of your sentencing, and it's $250,000. Well, I said I was sorry. Is that enough? <laughs> no, because there's a penalty, a fine attached to your crime, and it's going to cost you this much. What if I said I don't have that much? Well, it doesn't matter. You, you have to pay it. What if all of a sudden, in the moment that that judge issues my sentence, my punishment, Even though I said I'm sorry, and he seemed to be merciful, or she seemed to be merciful, there's a payment that's required. What if all of a sudden that judge stood up, took off their robe, came down, stood by me, and then wrote a a check to pay for my crime? Would you say that judge has not only embodied justice, but also embodied mercy? That judge did for me what I could never do for myself. This is what happens at the cross of Christ. Right? God says, here's the punishment you need to pay. You're condemned, but you can never pay for that condemnation. But there's someone who's willing to pay for your condemnation. And so when we think about the basis of real freedom and its ultimate Christ, Christ has come to set us free and to live in that freedom. Think about the two aspects of what Christ has done. He's been passively obedient, and he's been actively obedient. What do we mean by passively obedient? We mean this, that Christ becomes our punishment. That he bears our guilt, he takes our shame. God declares us innocent. But active obedience is not just enough, because even though we are declared innocent, we're not declared righteous. Through Christ's active obedience, he becomes our perfection because righteousness requires action. And if we don't have any right actions, we're not righteous before God. So what does Christ do? Twofold. He dies for our sins and he lives for our righteousness. We have to just stop. Think about what I just said. 
So many of us live in the realm of Christ dying for our sins, which I'm going to tell you right now. It's right, but it's not complete. Christ not only had to die for your sins, he had to live for your righteousness. Hence, 30 years of a sinless, spotless, blameless, perfect life. And he who knew no sin becomes sin on our behalf. Why? So that we could become the righteousness of God through him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Wow. What, what hope do I have? I have Christ. Because at the, at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, God is holy, God is righteous, God is merciful, God is gracious. And here's what God says to all of humanity. Every sin will be punished. The question is, will it be Christ or will it be you? No sin goes unpunished. Will it be Jesus who takes it upon himself? Or are you going to try to withstand the, the judgment of God? Because I'm going to tell you right now, that's not going to look pretty. You're not going to fare well. Even though there's people out there that are saying, no, thank you, Jesus, I got this. You will not survive. What hope do we have? Christ became a curse for Scott Morgan. There's my hope. Christ took my sin upon himself and not only subtracted something from my life that, that made me condemn before God, but now presented something positive to my account. It's called righteousness. Think about your salvation this way. Christ takes your sin, gives you his righteousness. See, if he only took your sin, you're left with a nothing. You have to have something credited to your account. And this is what Paul talks about in Romans 3, Romans 4, Romans 4. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Right? This is not anything you could ever earn or merit or, 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 or do on your own. You are looking to someone that can do for you what you can never do for yourself. So are we thankful that Jesus has died for our sins? Yes! But are we thankful that he lived for our righteousness as well? Wow! And so Romans 8.3 perhaps is the greatest verse that communicates these truths in which we're talking about. Jesus is passive obedience that we don't have to bear our sins. He does it for us. Woo! Hallelujah! What a Savior! And his act of obedience that says he becomes our perfection, that perfect work that we could never perform. He does it for us. And this, and this was right, stated right at the beginning of his ministry, baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist, right? Matthew chapter 3, verse 15. Look what it says. Right out of the gate, Jesus announces this, right? Jesus answers and says, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus sets out to not abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill the law and the prophets. Does for us what we can never do for ourselves. This is why we are joyful. This is why we're excited. Jesus not only had to die for our sins, but to live for our righteousness. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the gospel. Jesus, God pours out upon Christ the condemnation that we deserve. So now he stands condemned for my sin in his flesh. And the question is now, do you believe this? You, you want to you wanna look out for yourself? You're going to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps? You're going to try to do enough good things to earn God's approval? Good luck with that. Me, at the end of the day, I'm going to fall on Christ and his mercy and say, he stands condemned for me. And I will, I will trust in him. Which leads us to our final point, and this is just encouragement for you. Because it's one thing for us who do believe who have turned and trusted to still live as though something depends on us. I'm going to remind you of two important truths that have encouraged me in my journey as a, as a believer, and, and this is the consolation part. So we're back to Simeon and Luke 2, right? The consolation of Israel. What does consolation mean? Anyone want to give a quick definition? Comfort. Something that gives you hopefulness, right? The consolation, here's the beauty of real freedom. Two truths. You have an advocate and you've been acquitted. So if Christ takes the condemnation of God 
there is now no condemnation for you in Christ Jesus. No, not now. No, not ever. Come on, you guys. I'm about ready to get excited. (laughs) Joy explosion, right? There's no condemnation, right? Jesus has done it all. God doesn't see me as a possible candidate of heaven. He doesn't see me as a possible child of his. He sees me as a certain. You can be assured, Scott Morgan, that what Jesus has done on the cross was complete. You're in. I love you. And no one or nothing can ever separate you from my love. I've got an advocate. I'm not pleading my case. I'm leaning on him. He's pleading my case. And he now stands before the Father and says, I've got Scott Morgan. He has turned and trusted in me. He has become a curse for me. He has taken the wrath of the Father so I don't have to stand under the wrath of the Father. He has taken my condemnation so now there's no condemnation for me who is in Christ Jesus. I have an advocate. Woohoo! And this is important because while you have an advocate, there is still this being called an accuser that exists in our world. And while the accuser perhaps is at our right hand, we have one who's an advocate who's at the Father's right hand. Ladies and gentlemen, the accuser has nothing on you. You know what our advocate has done? He has defanged our enemy. He has declawed our enemy. Our enemy can no longer stand against us and say to us, God doesn't love you. God doesn't like you. God still holds you responsible for your sin. Those are lies. Those are the accusations of someone who is so distant from God, who doesn't understand the things of God. We who have an advocate need to stand firm in him who has made us more than conquerors. As a matter of fact, look at the end of chapter 8 of Romans, and I want just you to see how why this is just a marvelous chapter. Romans chapter 8 starts, there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So Paul is coming out of the gates and he's saying, I'm going to encourage you, church. I want to bless you, church. I want to give you hope, church. I want to give you joy, church. I want to remind you of true freedom, church, right? That this work of the Spirit that has brought you from death to life is a work of God who is faithful to say, I will never penalize you because of your sin. If you believe in Jesus, he's taking your sin for you, right? And so therefore, verse 5 says, the mind that's set on the flesh leads to death. Don't think about fleshly things. Think about eternal things. The mind set on the Spirit is life, right? And he writes and he talks about who we are in Christ, our identity, our position in Christ. He says in in chapter 16, right, you've been adopted as sons and daughters of the Most High. You are now co-heirs of all the rich inheritance that belong to Jesus, also belong to you. Are you kidding me? Wow! He talks about, are you, are you suffering through life? Well, don't consider this momentary light affliction as, as anything compared to the eternal weight of glory. Just like a woman who goes through a short period of time giving birth to a child. Once that child is born, she doesn't remember the pain anymore, right? And he says, uh, God is able to work out all things according to, his, to, the, to the good of those who love him, right? In verse 28, that's a very famous section. And then goes into the golden chain of salvation. And then we get to verse 31. Check this out. Look how he closes out this section, and he says, back to the topic of condemnation. Let me root you in something that is immovable. Let me root you in something that's so excitable. And it's this. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Some of you are going, my wife. No, wrong. Some of you say, my husband. No, that's not right. My boss, my coworker, my neighbor, my children. No, If God is for you, who can be against you? You act as if things are against you, but if God's for you, nothing's against you. Right? Look at verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Meaning we ought to be the most hopeful, most joyful, most optimistic people in the entire world. But oftentimes Christians go through life mourning and grieving and grumbling and complaining because I don't have this and I don't have that. Shut up! If you have Christ, you have more than you need. You have all that you need. I would say shut up in a a spirit of gentleness. But... People, we sing songs in our churches, and I don't want to be a church. Jeremy and I have already talked about this. We're not going to sing songs like, I need more of Jesus. I need more of this. I need more of that. Have you ever listened to Christian music today? Oftentimes it is horrible because it acts as if God hasn't done enough. Stop. 
He's done it all in Christ, and perhaps the problem is with you not sinking your heart deep into the gospel message that he has stood in your place. He has taken your condemnation, and now in Christ you lack nothing. So what are you going to complain about? What are you going to grumble about? In the spirit of gentleness, shut up. If you have Christ, you've got it all. Right? Don't listen to the enemy. Listen to your advocate. Stop listening to the accuser. Start listening to the one who sits at the right hand of the Father, who, look what it says here, who will bring a charge against God's elect? Verse 33, God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Rather, is he who is raised, who is at the right hand of God right now interceding for us. As if his work is not done, here's what it says, because God loves us so much through his son, Jesus Christ, that son continues to be a mediator on our behalf before the Father. He intercedes for us. As if you thought Jesus ascended, and now he's just in his thongs, uh, flip-flops, with a Mai Tai, at the palm trees of heaven, just writing the rest of this thing out. He is still working for you. And don't you dare go to him and say, he's not done enough. He, stands, he sits at the right hand of the Father, interceding day and night. That's what Hebrews says, interceding day and night for you. Are you kidding me? Just when Jesus goes this far, he goes even further, of sharing with you how much he delights in you. Whew. Who shall separate us, verse 35, from the love of Christ? Politics, Biden. Trump, Mexico, Israel, Palestine, Russia, Ukraine, blah, blah, blah. Paul goes, think about all the things that you're worried about and stop. You will be kept in perfect peace whose mind is set on you, God. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer. I'm looking for the men and women in Christ who are overwhelmingly conquering in their life. Because I don't see a lot of overwhelmingly conquering. I see a lot of overwhelmingly bickering. Let's be honest. This world will never work out the way you want it to, nor should it. But God will always work out things in a manner that's consistent with his character and your adoption as his kid. But what shall we say, right? If we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us, and this is how we overwhelmingly conquer through him, it's not good enough to be with Jesus. Too many Christians are with Jesus. They're not in Jesus. Simply because of the message we're talking about today. People don't know why they're saved. They don't know how they're saved. They couldn't give you a gospel explanation. But I'm going to tell you right now, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come. Nothing will separate you from the love of Christ, from the love of God that's found in Jesus Christ. Amen. Merry Christmas. He is risen. Merry Christmas. He has made you more than conquerors. Merry Christmas. He has taken your condemnation. Merry Christmas. He did for us what we can never do for ourselves. Don't let this be another hopeless Christmas. Know him who is the hope of the world. And all God's people said, amen. amen. I didn't yell at you guys as much as I did first service, so you got off easy today. I love you guys. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thanks for today. Thank you for... Um, gospel reminders. Lord, it's amazing as we go through life, there's just certain times of the year, certain seasons that they contain gospel moments. And, and we have another one, a big one, right on our doorstep. I'm praying that those who are maybe with you but not in you here in this room today would be today in you. That they would understand the great exchange that took place because of the arrival of Christ. You take our sin and you give us his righteousness. What a gift. We are humbled. 
by that mercy. We are humbled by your grace, O oh God. Thank you for doing for us what we can never do for ourselves. So I pray that those who are not yet in Christ today would be the day of salvation. Help us to surrender and believe, to, to turn and trust. And for those of us in Christ Jesus, um, perhaps we need to do a little bit of a heart inventory and, and realize what we have and who we have. We've probably gone through life ungrateful and probably discontented and frustrated, and yet uh, probably because we got our eyes off the prize. Lord, bring us back to, to, to this rudimentary elementary foundation that is the gospel, that if you are for us, who can be against us? We have everything we need. So thank you, Father, for, for loving us, for giving us these reminders, for calling us to yourself, for just this this message of condemnation. Thank you that there is no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Thank you. And we pray this in his name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen.